All right, all right, all right. <laughs> order, order. It's like Newbold College. Order, order. <laughs> All right. I, I encourage those students who are still talking to. I guess it's it's time to to continue. Speaking of time, uh, I still recall. You know when I did my first trip to Ephesus. And I was just about to leave the site. There was a vendor at the right side. I still recall it was the right side, a vendor. And the sign read, genuine fake watches. Speaking of time, so here we go. Our next presenter is um, Dr. Ken Bremlett. Uh, he's professor of archeology span and the history of antiquity at La Sierra University where he has taught since 2010. He's chair of the Department of Biblical Studies and the Archaeology Department, uh, also the director of graduate studies in archaeology. He's curator of the archaeology collections and associate director of the Center for Eastern Archaeology. He earned degrees in theology and biblical languages at Walla Walla College before getting an MA in Near Eastern Languages at Andrews University and going on to complete a PhD in Near Eastern Archaeology at the University of Toronto, specializing in the late Mons age. He is co-director of the Madaba Plains Project excavation at Tel Alomiri, as, uh, as well as my colleague and co-director at the Balua Regional Archaeological Project, both in Jordan. Here at La Sierra, Ken teaches Akkadian, hieroglyphic, Egyptian, and other ancient languages, in addition to archaeology classes. Ken has the gift of turning dry stones into water. Students love his classes. He has authored, edited, or co-edited 28 articles and one book and has made dozens of presentations. He enjoys traveling and has backpacked in more than 60 countries, visiting sites of historical significance and natural wonder. His presentation today's When Talus Ditched the Gods, The Disenchantment of Nature and the Beginning of Science, Kent. Thank you, Thank you Friedberg. Yes. Um, on November 1, All Saints Day, in the year 1755, the first of several massive quakes hit the city of Lisbon. It was about 9.40 a.m. on Sunday morning, and thousands of citizens were in the church, churches attending mass for the holy day. A large fault slip off the Atlantic coast between the Azores and Gibraltar plates sent three clusters of shockwaves inland sloshing lakes as far north as Scotland. But it was Lisbon that received the most devastating direct hit. Lisbon was then the fourth largest city in Europe and its port was probably the most wealthy. Um, of a population of about 200,000 or many estimates place it higher than that. And about a quarter of the, of the population died that morning. Unreinforced buildings collapsed into the narrow streets, blocking them with rubble. Large structures were weakened. Many who weren't in church rushed to join the services to pray. Minutes later, a second stronger quake hit, lasting several minutes. Buildings that had survived the first onslaught crashed down. Cathedrals and churches collapsed, burying the penitent. Candles lit for All Saints Day in the churches and in the homes across the city started fires which blazed through the fallen in, and intact buildings indiscriminately. The 70,000 books of the Royal Library were lost, including the notes and records of Vasco da Gama's sea voyages. People caught in the rubble were abandoned to the flames as the survivors fled to the water's edge. 
the river Tagus retreated and the sunken ships with treasure appeared on the harbor's muddy bottom. Not understanding the hydrodynamics of offshore quakes, some scrambled for the treasure, others sought boats to take them to safety. When about 45 minutes later, a 30 foot tsunami bore down on them and many of those former survivors perished. The compounded tragedy seemed to be judgment from God. The Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, were particularly strong in Portugal at this time, and they interpreted the disaster as God's wrath. And they and other devoutly religious people said it was everyone's duty first and foremost to repent and rid the city of heretics. The French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau thought the disaster was proof for his theory of natural man, where God was punishing the population for not living among the trees and in nature. Christians across the continent had little alternative to explain the act of God. King Joseph I, Jose I of Portugal, who was better at playing cards than ruling, asked his chief minister, Carvalho, what he should do. To which Carvalho, later known as the Marquis de um, Pombal, famously replied, bury the dead and feed the living. That sounded like uh, a good plan. So he was promptly placed in charge with sweeping powers. Pombal, as he's usually referred to, began the first modern disaster relief program in history. Concerned about the spread of disease from de decomposing bodies, he had tens of thousands of corpses put on barges that were taken out to sea and sunk. There was some opposition from the establishment at that, but he persevered. He charged the army with uh, delivering food to the city to prevent looting and to keep the people from fleeing into overcrowded areas. Everyone entering or leaving the city required a pass. He gave uh, judges, the power to convict, sentence, and hang looters on the spot. To prevent profiteering, he fixed food prices, removed taxes on fish, and took possession of all construction materials. Ships were not allowed to leave the harbor with goods that might be needed for the relief effort. Although the homeless population now lived in tents, Pombal made it illegal for landlords to evict tenants so that the people could eventually return home. He also demanded that the clergy stop preaching, the end of days was near. The researcher Nicholas Schrady wrote, Protestants and Catholics agreed on one indisputable point. Behind the earthquake lay the hand of God, and any talk of natural causes was akin to blasphemy. John Wesley, founder of Methodism, the Methodist denomination, wrote a tract entitled, Some Thoughts Occasioned by the Late Earthquake of Lisbon. Uh, and he penned a hymn with these memorable lines, I'll, I'll uh, mention just four of them. Woe to the men on earth who dwell, nor dread the almighty frown, when God doth all his wrath reveal and showers his judgments down. But one man disagreed, Voltaire. All Europe awaited his, his comment, and he soon did with his famous work, Candide, and in his poem, on the Lisbon disaster in translation. Voltaire's Candide attacks the notion that all is for the best in this, the best of all possible worlds, a definition and argument of Leibniz, and spurred much discussion of theodicy or the philosophical justification of God in the face of what we experience in the world. Immanuel Kant, who is a young man at the time, but quite, um, definitely following the, the news with the earthquake, published uh, a number of tracts on this and eventually a small book um, that probably represents the beginning of seismology. Although his particular mechanism for the causation of earthquakes was incorrect, he thought there were voids below that were collapsing and causing these shock waves. Just eight years before the Lisbon earthquake, French mathematician Jean de Lambert had made a progress in understanding wave propagation in, with experiments on transverse vibrations. The dots were really connected by the Reverend John Mitchell, professor of geology at Cambridge in 1760, so just five years after the quake. He, he looked at the projected back, the, the direction the quake had come from, and um, although he didn't know about plate tectonics, uh, he was pretty spot on on the rest of his um, speculations. 
King Joseph's man in charge, the Marquis de Pombal, aligned himself with this attitude and in the face of religious opposition, determined to rebuild the city and in the process, nurture the mercantile middle class while cleverly undermining the aristocracy and clergy. Pombal's most innovative ambition, however, was to make the buildings of the resurrected Lisbon earthquake proof. Instead of clearing away the rubble, Pombal's engineers decided to build on top of it, giving some much needed solidity to the ground. Masts from wrecked ships in the harbor were taken and set into the ground as pilings on which the new buildings would be constructed. Most of all, the brick and masonry walls of the new structures would be built around an inner framework of crossed timbers and iron cross ties that would give the walls both strength and the elasticity to endure uh, shocks or tremors. Pombal exemplified the attitude that it was a natural disaster and we can be more prepared next time. Thus, out of the catastrophe arose a new intellectual relationship with the natural world. Or was it new? Um, let's move forward a few slides. Here's pictures of Lisbon. Um, of course, these are all just paintings from um, eyewitness accounts. Um, this is Pombal here. There's a, he's still remembered today. And um, let's then go to the topic of our of our subject, Thales. We go back 2,300 years to about the year 585 BCE to the Greek Ionian city of Miletus and to the first of the pre-Socratic philosophers. This is where Greek natural philosophy began. And according to Aristotle, some two centuries later, it began with a man named Thales. Born about 625, in Miletus, near the mouth of the Meander River, a natural port, Thales was the first of the seven sages of ancient Greece. Numerous later Greek authors credited him with beginning the rational inquiry into the first principles of the world. What were things made of? What were the causes of what we now call natural phenomena? Thales began a tradition of inquiry that emphasized open-minded thinking, discuss discussion, and theorizing. These early philosophers did not merely pose a new set of questions, they also sought new kinds of answers. Homer had explained earthquakes as the striding of an angry Poseidon. Even Herodotus retained much of the old mythology and didn't avoid discourse, recourse to the gods when explaining natural phenomena. But in a development termed the Ionian Enlightenment, Thales, his student Anaximander, and his successor Anaximenes began to explain nature on its own terms and resulted in the disenchantment of nature. Think of what an enchanted forest would be, right? Full of deities and entities and forces. The disenchantment of nature removes that element, that intervention from most everyday natural occurrences. Thales explained earthquakes for the first time we know of in history as a natural physical process. He suggested that the earth floats on water and the earth is rocked by waves causing the tremors. While we now know that isn't correct, it isn't less rational than Immanuel Kant's theory of collapsing underground voids. Herodotus relates a story that was widely told about Thales and really marks the beginning of Greek philosophy and science. He is the earliest of many ancient uh, references and retellings, his, uh, um, account is, and so there must be something to it if we can extract the historical kernel. Here's what Herodotus wrote. He says, in the course of it, referring to this ongoing battle between the Medes and the Lydians, um, he says, the Medes gained many victories over the Lydians, and the Lydians also gained many victories over the Medes. Among their other battles, there was one night engagement. As, however, the balance had not inclined in favor of either nation, another combat took place in the sixth year, in the course of which, just as the battle was growing warm, day was on a sudden change into night. The event had been foretold by Thales, the Milesian, who forewarned the Ionians of it, fixing for it the very year in which it actually took place. The Medes and Lydians, when they observed this change, ceased fighting and were alike anxious to have terms of peace agreed on. So we can imagine something like this. 
By the year 585, the Lydians and the Medes, remember the Iron Age Indo-European uh, migrants into um, the region of, of what's now Iran, um, had been at war for nearly six years, as Herodotus recounts. The war itself seemed to be at a stalemate, and neither side was showing um, signs of giving up. Um, the, the battles would go on, it seemed, indefinitely. The soldiers were engaged in battle on May 28, 585, when the, it, the sky suddenly turned dark. The entire battlefield and surrounding countryside were plunged into uh, darkness. The men on both sides of the front line were frightened and surprised. They stood in shock during the duration of the eclipse, which lasted a few minutes. And when the moon moved from in front of the sun and daylight returned to the land, the scared soldiers threw down their weapons and declared an end to the fighting. A truce followed. There have been a lot of questions about the sort. Could Thales really have predicted an eclipse? Or to what accuracy could he have done so? Let's come back to this, but first let's look at the scientific developments that the Milesian school uh, became famous for and the sources upon which they built. Um, here's just a quick timeline. Um, Thales there is on the far left. So the, the beginning of Greek philosophers, the pre-Socratics, first of all, pre-Socrates, um, but then continuing on down. Thales and the other Milesian pre-Socratics like Anaximander, Anaximenes, and Anaxagoras, who is the one who actually introduced the Ionian ideas into Athens uh, during the, the sixth century, and Xenophanes, who took similar ideas to Magna Graecia uh, in Southern Italy and Sicily region, along with Pythagoras, who by the way was from Samos, but that was part of the Ionian uh, identity. And at age 40, he also moved away. It was said he wanted some privacy, but that didn't last too long. Uh, they, they championed the free debate of ideas relating both to the human realm, politics, society, life of the mind, and the physical world, which they tried to understand in terms of natural processes and mathematics. So why Miletus? Miletus was considered among the greatest and wealthiest of Greek cities before the Persian invasion of the mid sixth century, um, 546. Miletus was called the jewel of Ionia by Herodotus and had been founded by Greek settlers on the coast of Western Asia, what's now the Southwest coast of Turkey and was positioned uniquely as a crossroads between East and West. East as in the old civilizations of Mesopotamia and, and Egypt, and the West, which was to become prominent under Greek and, and then Roman Empire. Peter Watson, in his book, oh, let me point out here, this is a map of the harbor, and um, it progressively silted in, a problem also referred, mentioned uh, yesterday with the harbor of Ephesus. But you can see this is the original sort of Bronze Age um, shoreline, and then little lines that you might not be able to make out um, show the Hellenistic Roman period, um, uh, definition and then late antiquity finally reaches Miletus and then the, the modern um, shoreline. So now it's kilometers from, from the sea. Peter Watson in his book, Ideas, A History of Thought and Invention, propose uh, three, actually, let me just um, put up a few more slides. We're moving quickly through this, but here's an aerial showing the site of Miletus. Um, and with some of the significant archaeological sites uh, noted. Actually, the first screen I had up had a, had a um, reconstruction of the Ionic uh, Stoa area, which I thought was fitting because Stoas were, uh, you know, a center of, of thought and discussion uh, in many Greek cities um, near and the, the, the North Agora. Bathhouse over here, the theater, the, uh, Milet the theater of Miletus is, is famous. Um, however, you're looking at a composite, you know, and so in the time of Thales, that theater wasn't there, at least not at the size of seating 25,000 people. That's Roman. Um, it was much smaller in Hellenistic times, maybe seated 5,000, and I don't know really when the founding date of, of that was, if it went back much earlier. Um, so let's move then to uh, here's a reconstruction of, of the downtown area. But Peter Watson, and I'll, I'll leave it on this. This is, this is in the Pergamum Museum in Berlin, um, a reconstructed facade there. 
of the market gate at Miletus. So Peter Watson in his book, that, that history of ideas and thought and invention, um, proposes three reasons why Miletus may have been the, the center of um, this new way of thinking about nature. He said, the region did not belong to a powerful state between, and it was located, um, well, which many times are hostile to free thinking, depend on uh, what the subject is, but many times that's the case. He also proposed that the Ionians, because the Ionians were a seafaring people, they had access to a lot of different ideas and could make connections um, between, again, East and West, East being the, the regions of Egypt and the Middle East. Um, and his third reason was that Milesian culture was not priest ridden with a vested interest in the status quo. I think there he's merely comparing to places like Mesopotamia and Egypt, where you had very powerful uh, priestly guilds um, that weren't too friendly to um, dramatic change. Those could be some of the influences that, that came together uh, at Miletus. And, uh, and from that point, then it was just a, there was a lot of momentum that continued to develop. Two of those reasons relate to a kind of intellectual and political freedom, and the other to access the foundations, particularly uh, astronomical records and mathematical principles upon which to build. Indeed, we know that Thales himself had visited Egypt and Babylonia, and Pythagoras famously uh, traveled to Egypt. Um, according to some historical sources, Thales applied his intercept theorem. There's a couple of theorems that are associated with Thales. The intercept theorem to determine the height of the Great Pyramid of Cheops. Now here's his intercept theorem. And in essence, it makes some um, statements about what can be determined in the relationships between two, when two parallel lines intersect two or, or cross two intersecting lines. Now in the diagrams here, you can see the intersection of the, the two intersecting lines can be between the two parallel lines. It can be outside the two parallel lines. And then you can even, again, subdivide um, the intersecting lines to gain more insights. It's a version of this theorem that he seems to have applied at uh, Giza. Thales measured the length of the pyramid's base and the height of a pole that he was going to use. So he knew the, the height of his measuring pole and the length of the pyramid's base. Then at the same time of day, he measured the length of the pyramid's shadow and um, might be a little hard to see. I'll point out in just a minute here. The pyramid shadow and the length of the, sh of the pole shadow. So those are your two parallel lines because the sun is in the same position. So at the same time of day. Um, this yielded the following data. So the height of the pole, 1.63 meters, say. The shadow of the pole was say, two meters. We don't have his notes, but these are some of the claims made later. The length of the pyramid base was 230 meters. Of course, then you can just divide it by half to find the midpoint. And the shadow of the pyramid extending beyond the, the edge of the base was 65 meters. So then knowing those elements, he was a and see he was now able to apply the intercept theorem and compute the unknown um, height, which is D there on that diagram. And his result was 146.7 meters in modern measurements or, um, or 481 feet. And that's often still the height of the pyramid that's, that's given. Um, however, it is actually 481 feet in height now. But um, one can have recourse to the argument that, well, it's lost a little bit of its original height. Um, and so we credit Thales with being um, quite accurate. The argument goes back to the idea that the original dimensions of the pyramid were 280 royal cubits, and that would put it at 481 feet. Um, Greek science owed a lot of debt a large debt to Egypt and Mesopotamia, but it, at the same time, it was different. Milesians, um, as we mentioned, had visited Egypt and um, borrowed a lot of the known formulas and, and approaches, but their, their goals and methods were very different. The nature, uh, the discovery of nature was a major 
uh, goal in contrast to the astronomy of Babylonia and Assyria in which divination um, or um, the application of astrology was the major uh, application, really the only application. And also with the Greeks, the, uh, the practice of rational criticism and debate. Um, I decided to try out Thales' um, process of, of measuring. And so a year ago, I took, when my boys and I were up at my, my, my parents' place in Washington, we measured the heights of some trees. This is applied Thales. And so we went out in the woods, cut down a pole, 10 foot pole, and then um, used sort of the modified version of, of Thales' uh, relationships um, and cited from ground a level across the top of the pole to the top of the tree and then we're able to um, solve our unknown height of the tree. So we did it in a couple of places. Uh, and, and that was a lot of fun. We recognize that when the ground isn't level, that's a bit more of a problem, but um, we showed it can work, right? Going back to the eclipse then, um, by the, by, how did he do it? We left that question hanging, or did he even do it? Okay, so by the early middle part of the um, first millennium BCE, about 700, uh, certainly in Assyrian uh, astronomical records, we know that in Babylonia, in Assyria, they were able to calculate that there were 38 possible eclipses or syzygies, as the Greeks called eclipses, within a period of 223 months. So that's about 18 years. This period of 223 months is called a Saros cycle by modern astronomers. And a sequence of eclipses um, constitute um, a Saros cycle or series. Although scientists now know that the number of lunar and solar eclipses is not exactly the same in every Saros series. And one of the problems is that the, it's not quite a whole number. So you have fractional um, com components. Um, so one cannot underplay, though, the achievement of Babylonian scholars in understanding this astronomical phenomenon. Their realization of this cycle eventually allowed them to predict the occurrences of eclipse of an eclipse. We think this happened about 700 BCE. The level of astronomical knowledge achieved in ancient Babylonia cannot be separated from the astrological tradition um, that regarded eclipses as omens. Astronomy and astrology were two sides of the same coin. For example, an eclipse could foretell the death of a king. The conditions for an omen to be considered as such were not simple. In order to preempt the monarch's fate, a mechanism was divide, devised, the substitution of the king ritual called a shar puhi. There are over 30 mentions of this ritual in various letters from Assyria during the first millennium. In this ritual, a person would be selected, chosen to replace the king, and he would be dressed like the king and placed on the throne. But to make sure that nobody really misunderstood that you know, this was a, a valid succession, um, they read the omen text, the negative omen text, uh, to be triggered by the uh, eclipse. So the real king then would keep a low profile and avoid being seen. So if anything were you know, predetermined to happen, it would happen to this poor guy that was um, king for a day. So if no negative portents were observed, the substitute king would be put to death at least then they'd be sure to fulfill the prophetic reading of the celestial omen and then save the life of the real king. I imagine the king for a day wasn't a volunteer position. Thales was clearly a student of astronomy, um, but in contrast to his sources, he put it to the task of understanding the heavens. Um, we'll just skip by this, but he, he is recorded as, as um, noting the position of the, uh, the little bear, the North Star uh, constellation. The Phoenicians were already using that though for, um, for their navigation. And I would note many of you are familiar with the um, Antikythera mechanism. There continue to be great um, publications and research being done on that, discovered uh, 120 years ago. And um, Thales certainly didn't make that, um, um, but, and I want to read a quote here, by the way, if you haven't seen it, just Google it. There's several good YouTube um, presentations and reconstructions of it. Um, let me go back. Um, I wanted to um, read 
um, in one of my, um, yeah, the reference here, um, it said that, uh, that um, he probably, he built some kind of sphere, it said. So not, we don't know how complicated it is, but some sort of planetarium type sphere that, that could um, show the positions of the, of the planets uh, or stars in the constellations and planets. Okay, so probably not um, as complicated as the Antikythera mechanism, but on that trajectory. Okay, um, what about then the, the ability to predict some think that he did know the Soros cycle. Some even suggest he knew the, um, the exoligmos cycle. It's a series of three Soros cycles, um, but the eclipse occurs at the same time of day. So if you remember back three series of the Soros cycles back, what time it happened, then you would actually know what time of day to expect the next one. That would be very clever if he was able to, if he did do that, because then he would um, be able to pr uh, predict the time of day. At any rate, the vital points are these. Thales foretold a solar eclipse and it did occur within the period he specified. And most significantly, it seems to have provided credence or credence to the emerging philosophy of the Milesian school. Um, one additional thing about Thales, he's credited with a lot of things, but the story is told that they started saying, well, if you're such a smart philosopher, why aren't you also rich? Good question, right? Um, and this story, there's a couple of versions of it, but Aristotle, well, he, he did then, he decided to, to show them that he could become wealthy if he had wanted, if he wanted to. And he used um, a, a prediction of the weather conditions and the effect it would have on the olive harvest to do so. Now, exactly what he did is, there's two versions. Aristotle said that Thales, um, um, yeah, let's skip down here. The Thales was, um, was, I'll skip this a little bit. Um, there were two versions of the story. In one version, he, he bought all the olive presses in Miletus. So this one, he puts the money down, he buys all of the olive presses after predicting that the weather uh, is going to have, produce a good harvest. In the other story, he sort of puts down a down payment and he options on, uh, up the, um, the olive presses. And then when there is a, a good uh, bumper crop, he rents them out since he has the, the option on them. So one is sort of a futures concept and the other is sort of an options concept. So whatever, however it was, it said that uh, Thales um, became wealthy from that uh, occasion. So the, we then draw back to our original thoughts of the disenchantment of nature. The question might be asked, does the Ionian disenchantment of nature, the proposition that envisaged phenomena as natural events with natural causes and possible of explanation, inherently, a, inherently atheistic with no place for spiritual component to reality? Thales' pioneering of natural philosophy didn't make him irreligious. True, we don't find have much preserved of his religious perspectives, but one only need to read Cicero's work on the nature of the gods to guess at what Thales might have believed. The Latin author Cicero in the time of Caesar Augustus characterized the myths about the gods as old wives tales. In this book he wrote, and I quote, this has given rise to false beliefs, wild errors, and all the stuff of old wives tales. We even think we know the appearance of the gods, their age, their costumes, and their fashions. We claim to know their family histories, their marriages, and their relationships. According to the legends, they are even plagued by strife and war. And he continues on and speaks of the difference between religion and superstition. He goes on to explain how the world is governed by their, the, the, that is divine providence. And in book two, Chapter verses 74 to 77, he says, my belief is that the universe and everything in it has been created by the providence of the gods and is governed by the providence through all eternity. So the disenchantment of nature or the demythologization of the natural world doesn't preclude a rational spiritual spirituality and belief in the divine. What it did preclude was the entanglement of the daily workings of nature with the capricious activities of the gods. It is this sentiment or, and insight that Voltaire shared. And it, it was these two enlightenments, the Ionian enlightenment and the later European enlightenment that made the modern world of science, technology and medicine possible. 
And I enjoy my smartphone. I appreciate the benefits of modern medicine. We owe the modern world to the way of thinking that began at Miletus. The Ionian Enlightenment contained the roots of a very productive way of looking at the world around us. When the Marquis de Pombal chose to see the Lisbon earthquake as the result of natural processes, he could concentrate on burying the dead and feeding the living, and then invent ways to build more resilient structures that might better withstand future, future natural disasters. I think Thales would approve. What fun. <laughs> Thank you, Kent, for, for bringing something else out of Southwest Turkey that most of us probably hadn't been thinking about, at least recently. Uh, anybody have a question? I think we'll take time for one or two questions. Don, anybody uh, coming in there? So any questions you want to ask of Kent? We have, no, not, not quite. That was, that was another action, a hand action. Anybody have a question? Thank you, Kent, for introducing us to, to Miletus in Southwest Turkey.